Okay, we're going to get started here. Um, so this is the REST and serialization in Drupal 8 presentation, and I have to say that there's a lot of code on the slides, it turns out. We figured this out this morning. <laughs> So uh, that does have the side effect of um, making it somewhat difficult to read them from further back. If you are interested in those details, you might want to move closer. We also have the slides available on GitHub pages. So if you go to the presentation, uh, the session page on Drupal.org, at the bottom you'll see the link to the slides. Um, unfortunately, we didn't optimize the images and everything, so it might take a while for them to get down to your computer. But um, but you can look at them there when they come in. So, um, I am Lynn Clark. I am an independent developer. I've been working on serialization issues in uh, Drupal for the past nine months, or six, six to nine months, I've been working on Drupal 8. And before that, I was working on other ways of getting data in and out of Drupal and Drupal 7. And this is Klaus. Hello, I am Klaus Buhler. I'm working for Epico, a small company based in Vienna. We're doing the recruiter distribution, and I've been involved with uh, web services for some time now. Um, you might also know me from the project applications queue, so I do a lot of code review and helping onboarding new contributors. I'm also a member of the security team. Um, that's basically it. So, first I'm going to start with this. What is REST? Um, you know, people have been really, really excited about the fact that we have REST in Drupal 8, but I, I'm not sure that um, everybody's on the same page as to what REST actually is. So I want to do a little bit of just introductory, get everybody on the same page, and then Klaus is going to go into how it actually works as it is right now in Drupal 8, and then I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about the serialization stuff, and also talk about what the next steps for making it a more RESTful system are. So uh, I'm first going to start with some pretty dry definitions. Um, for, you know, it's RESTful web services. So Wikipedia defines a web service as a method of communication between two electronic devices over the World Wide Web. And so that's really a boring way of saying what you do every single day when you go on the web. You know, say that you have an iPhone app, and that's connected to OpenStreetMap. And, um, you know, you send a request maybe to get Portland map data or add a new road, because, you know, OpenStreetMap is, is read-write. So, basically, the two electronic devices here are the client on your phone and the server that has all the data. So, a web service is basically a way of telling, um, you know, getting the command or the operation from the client to the server and having communication between those two. And REST is a particular architecture for doing this kind of thing. Um, a, it's a style of software architecture for distributed systems such as the World Wide Web. Um, so the guy who came up with this, um, this concept of REST, he was heavily involved in HTTP, um, the development of the early, early web standards. And so he actually uh, came up with REST as a formalization of what they had been doing, a way of describing how the things actually work. So whenever you're using the World Wide Web, you're actually using a very basic, you know, the, the minimal set of um, REST architecture. Um, so I just want to get everybody um, a picture of what REST in Drupal is right now. So I'm going to run the most basic REST request. Um, I'm going to get a node, and I'm going to get it in JSON. So to do this, I go to a particular URI. try refreshing this. This worked before. Let's see. So I'm going to go to a URI, and I'm going to uh, use get to actually get the node. And you'll see here that I actually have a, an accept header. I'm telling it what version of the, you know, what um, syntax I want this node to come back in. I'm going to say application JSON. And then when I send, you see it actually gives me that node in JSON. So there are four components to this REST request. There's the base format, 
the HTTP verbs, the URI, and the media type, also known as the mind type. And I'm going to go through and explain um, what, how these all relate. So base format, that is just, you know, you're, you're pretty familiar with base format. They're the syntax that you put data into. So JSON is one example of a base format. And XML is another version. And there are URIs. When you're working with a REST service, uh, you're working with a set of URIs. So URIs um, can be URIs for a resource. Um, for example, we have entity slash node slash one as the URI that you interact with to work on top on a resource um, in Drupal. We're actually hoping to change it so that you don't actually have to have entity in the path. That's something that we would like to have happen. Um, and we'll see if that gets in um, soon. And you can also have URIs for what are called link relations. So the resource, you know, that's what you're interacting with. Um, the link relation is somewhat different. I'm actually going to talk more about link relations later in the presentation. Um, so I'll just leave it at that for now. So an example of what, you know, using URIs and not using URIs looks like um, is as follows. If you work, have worked with endpoints before where you just actually like send uh, something in JSON or XML that gives all of the information about you know, what the identifier for the thing is that you want to interact with and what the operation you want to have, what you want to do on that thing is, um, that is not RESTful. Uh, instead, you actually want to have a URI that represents the thing that you're interacting with. You don't um, want to tunnel everything through a single endpoint. Um, so media type. People often get the media type confused with the base format. So they think um, JSON is a media type, which it is. Application JSON is a media type. But you can also have more specific media types. For example, one that we're using in Drupal in the HAL module is um, application HAL plus JSON. And um, what that media type does is it gives a little bit more information about what the consumer can expect to find in the response. Um, so in how a consumer can expect to find links or embedded, um, you know, those are reserved keywords and the consumer knows what to do with the data that's inside of those, uh, of those, um, of those keywords. So uh, you can also, besides how, you know, HAL is actually a uh, standardized um, media type. It's an IETF draft. But you can also have vendor specific media types. So GitHub has their own media type, and they have their own rules for what consumers can expect when they receive um, something that's application then GitHub, GitHub plus JSON. Um, they say that all resources may have one or more um, underscore URL properties linking to other resources. Um, so that's basically providing the same functionality as what HAL is doing, but in a, a way that's very specific to GitHub. And so an example um, that this is um, something that a lot of pragmatic REST people will actually say you should do, where you actually have the file format, you know, so you have .json, and that's the way you switch between the HTML and the JSON version. Um, but it gets a little bit tough when you have media types like how, because, you know, you're basically creating your own file extensions at that point, and, and that gets a little confusing. Um, so instead, the best thing, in my opinion, to do is to use the accept header and actually specify uh, explicitly which media type you are expecting um, and, in the case of post, which you are um, sending. So HTTP methods, these are how you um, specify which operation you want to have done to the, the thing on the server. Um, get means go fetch this page or this resource and bring it back to me. Don't change it. Um, a lot of people implement get in a way where they actually, you can change things using get, but that's not a very good thing to do. Get should not change things um, on the server. Um, post, in our application, we're um, basically saying, here's some data, go make a thing for me. Post doesn't have strict rules. 
So you can't actually use it in other ways, but a lot of people use it basically for the create operation. Um, we are using patch instead of put, um, and patch is basically a way of saying, here are some changed fields, go update them on the existing thing. Um, so this is, you know, your update functionality. And then there's delete, which basically means get rid of that thing. And so an example of doing this wrong would be to actually put, or not restfully, would be to put the operation directly in your URI. So um, instead of that, you actually use the HTTP verbs, the HTTP methods to say what you want to have done. So let's look back at that request that I did and see how these all come into play. So we have our base format, which is JSON. The URI, which is NT node one. The HTTP method, which is get. And the media type, which is application slash JSON. Now, if I change a few of these things, for example, I change um, the URI to NT slash node, the uh, method to post, and the media type, let's take a look at what that is like. So I think I might have to drag it here. So here's the URI, and I'm changing the HTTP method. And here, you see I'm using content type instead of accept for my header, and I'm adding application how plus JSON. And now when I send it, you'll see that I actually created a node on my site. The 201 created, that's a status message, a status code, um, and that tells me that I was successful. I could have gotten other things like a 500 error or other kinds of status messages, but since I got a 201, I know it's been created. So, and I should also mention that this, um, what I'm showing you here, this um, is an HTTP client. It's one for Chrome is an extension for Chrome called Dev HTTP Client, but you can actually, you can get different browser extensions, you can also use curl, and you can also use HTTP directly from the code in your modules. So, now I want to take a look at how this all fits into restfulness, you know. There's a really good model for talking about how restful something is, it's called the Richardson Maturity Model. And this is uh, a guy named Martin Fowler, who you may have heard of before. He actually wrote about it on his blog. So this, this image is from his blog. Um, but level zero, that's basically uh, when you are not doing anything restfully at all. It's called the swamp of pots. Basically, when you're sending XML messages that contain the operation, the identifier, everything um, that you need, and you're sending that to an endpoint. Um, you're, you're tunneling that through an endpoint. Um, so that is level zero. Level one is actually when you start using those resources, when you start using those URIs to interact with things. So instead of sending the identifier as part of the body, you actually have a URI like thing slash three, which corresponds to your um, third thing. And we actually, we have that in place. Um, like I said, we want to change the URI a little bit, but that's pretty much in place. Level two is the HTTP verbs. Um, so that's get, patch, post. We have that pretty much in place. There are a few bugs that we need to um, resolve, but that's pretty much in place. Level three, that's where we start getting to the things that we haven't fully designed yet. Um, and I'm actually going to get to those later, so I'll just leave it at that. The hypermedia controls I'll explain later, but right now, Klaus is going to show you everything that we do have in core right now and how to use it. So uh, before I get into details, um, we are taking questions via Twitter. There is the uh, hashtag rest. I, I think it was not a good idea because a lot of people are tweeting weird stuff about rest. So, but never mind, use it anyway. If you have any questions, yeah, yeah, combine it with Drupal com. That might help. So. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how REST is now implemented in Drupal and how we uh, use those standards. So what we did in Drupal 8 is a module that um, is a server. So we're not talking about client stuff doing from Drupal, talking to other sites, but Drupal itself um, serving stuff out and accepting that. And to put that um, into perspective, um, we have to think about what we are tra actually trying to accomplish here. And we want to get stuff programmatically into and out of Drupal. We 
because um, we humans, humans just browse a page with our browser and we are able to detect what the title is on that page, but computers are dumb. They don't know where to look for the title of a note, for example. You have to tell them how the data is structured. And so we need um, formats and we need to specify how, how data is represented in order to make it machine readable. That's the machine readable format, like JSON, for example, uh, or XML or other stuff. So as I said, Drupal acts uh, as a web service uh, interface provider. And there are a couple of use cases that we can cover with that. I put up a phone here because it's the very uh, obvious reason everybody is talking about REST. You have your native applications and you want to talk to your backend, which can be a Drupal installation. So your phone app is sending those requests and getting data and posting data back. But of course, there might also be on-site JavaScript that wants to interact with your backend. Um, um, that use case um, driven to the extreme is just having a single page and then uh, everything changes dynamically on the page and sending requests back to the backend. You could do that. That's also supposed to be done with the REST module. Or you can use it for migrating, deploying stuff, uh, getting stuff into Drupal. So for example, you set up your staging content on your staging site because you don't want to mess around with your live site. You want to perfectly prepare that node, for example, on the staging site. And of course, you don't want to repeat those steps on the production site again. Do it on the staging site, push it over to the production server. That's one use case. And of course, a lot of people want to build uh, web APIs so that clients can access the data. And um, the rest stuff in Drupal 8 is supposed to be used as a private or as a public API, for example, to uh, migrate data um, from your legacy system into Drupal because you might not have access and kind of use the migrate module. So REST module is an application for that. And um, to get a little bit of historic content, what do we have in Drupal 7 right now? Uh, the most famous example is the services module. You can do a lot uh, with that. It has, uh, it, it has evolved from an RPC server, actually, and it was also supposed to uh, be used as a SOAP server. So it's not really in conformance with REST, but yeah, people use it a lot. And there's the concept of, of endpoints in, in services, which means you can specify at what, what URIs um, your resources are, going to, resources are going to appear which might conflict with um, actually hypermedia controls. I mean, we'll be talking about, is going to talk about that later. And it also uses, um, it is hard coded to nodes and commands and users, so there's no uh, support for arbitrary entities. And it does a bit of nasty stuff, um, submitting forms programmatically because um, the API in Drupal 6 and Drupal 7 wasn't ready yet um, to be used generically for a, a service provider. Yeah, and it has explicit authentication hooks, so when a request comes in, other models can hook in and provide an authentication mechanism and that stuff. Then what I did was the REST WS module uh, in Drupal 7 because I wanted to have something different. And it uses the Entity API, which is a very cool module. Um, it gives you all sort of metadata about any entity type in your, in your system. So with REST WS, you can expose basically any entity that you have at hand in Drupal 7 and can uh, do operations on it, for example, on nodes. Um, yeah, it's not perfect that module in Drupal 7 because we have a couple of problems with page caching because the page cache only works on a URI and when you have restfulness, you, only you also want, on, want to work on other HTTP headers, for example, the exact header or the content type header. So we have a couple of problems with that. And there's even a hybrid module that uses some approaches from REST WS, the services entity API, which is very interesting. It also brings um, the full power of the entity API working with any entity to the services module. I think it's a, a very interesting approach. And now looking at Drupal 8, what we have there are basically three modules, the REST web services module, uh, the serialization module, and the HAL module. The first one um, handles the requests and the responses. And the second one, the ser serialization module, um, transforms those objects, nodes, for example, that are in Drupal that live in a database that we load uh, down to just a string, a very long string probably, and that is what is shipped with the HTTP response that is delivered. And the HAL module um, provides a special format, um, so we settled on that for Drupal 8 as, as our uh, prime format, our canon canonical format. It has some nice hypermedia controls, um, it is based on JSON, and 
Yeah, that model module does that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hypertext application language is the acronym. So we have a couple of resources now in Drupal 8, and we have uh, operations, and we align them in that way, as shown here in the table. And of course, a resource is an object of interest, and that perfectly fits our uh, entity model because entities are also objects of interest, so we expose them as resources. That is a logical step we do. And, and what we here define as operation is an action that we uh, do or that we use to manipulate a resource. In the simplest case, I just want to read something. Okay, I can use a get request to that specific node, and then I get a representation of that. So we have the full coverage of all uh, CRUD operations, create, read, update, and delete. And we map them to the, their corresponding HTTP methods, post, get, patch, and delete. And we also map them to a specific path. As Lynn already said, there's uh, still the entity prefix in the URIs, as you can see here. Maybe we can remove that still in Drupal 8, but for now we did it at that path to not conflict with any uh, HTML representations that live at slash node slash one. So we are currently working on URI patterns for entities so that we can be more flexible there. So what we do in the uh, RESTful Web Service module is um, to expose entities as resources, as I said, and we use the plugin system for that. And to expose them, we use the uEntity API. So we basically just have one plugin that serves all entity types that there are, all entity types in core, and possibly all entity types that are added by Drupal contrib models, for example, uh, commerce product types or private message entities, uh, whatever. And we have metadata about that. We know which uh, fields are on an entity. So when a new entity is posted, I can inspect, yeah, I know that field, I can save that. And we also made it configurable so you can decide which entity on your site you want to expose and which uh, entities you want to leave alone because you might not want to expose private messages because they're an internal thing. You have a public facing API, just enable that for notes. Yeah, and we also have access control on entity level and on the field level, of course. So when you're um, trying to request a note and you're not supposed to see, uh, a field, for example, then it is automatically hidden. That is all driven by the usual entity and field access control mechanism we have in court. And then now you might ask, um, what about authentication and authorization? Who is allowed to do what? Who is allowed to read um, something? Who is allowed to manipulate something? And authentication itself, so uh, it's not handled by REST module itself. Unfortunately, we don't have any additional authentication mechanisms in core right now, only the usual uh, session cookie authentication, which is a bit clumsy to use from an API, but it's possible. I will show you that later. And access control is fully driven by um, the user object of Drupal, so standard permissions can apply, and the whole entity access system is, is, uh, is done around that, so we are using that here as well. And there's an extra user permission to access uh, an entity over the API, so there is an additional safety net uh, before you expose just anything about your entities and fields. Yes, that's about it. So what I would like to do now is a little bit of demonstration. It's not a real demonstration, but I, I put up some uh, code and calls how you can make use of the API. And the first thing you do, of course, is you need to have a Drupal 8 installation. I put up some Drush commands here because I use them a lot. It's very handy. So that would be the Drush uh, command to install your Drupal 8 site with a user account and a password. Then you need, of course, the serialization module and the REST web services module. I think, yeah, REST has a dependency to serialization, so you will enable that anyway. And, yeah, we want to work with HAL, so we also enable that. Just standard stuff, nothing fancy here. Then we... Let's say we want to work with the node resource. We want to read nodes now. How do we configure that? In Drupal 8, we use YAML file to configure stuff. So there's a rest.settings.yaml file. And we copy that from the active um, config directory to the staging config directory. So that's part of the CMI initiative uh, where you can uh, change your configuration and um, import it back in. Once you have done that, you just copy it over, so there's this long configuration path in your uh, um, files directory. You will find the file there. 
copy it over, then you edit it. And now we want to specify what we want to expose. So that is YAML. You might have seen it before. It's a very simple format. It works a lot with indentation. So the first line resources here um, defines the array of resources that is enabled. In this case, we just enable it for nodes. So entity colon node is the identifier of the node plugin that exposes that resource. And we only want to allow get requests. So we uh, write down get there. And we only want to allow one format, which is hell in this case. That's basically the structure. You can do that for other entity types. You can enable other request methods and other formats. Yeah. Then we import the configuration because we edited it in the staging directory. Now we want to make it active. You can do that with Rush even. I, I was very surprised that it actually works with Rush already. Uh, but you can also do it in the uh, Drupal 8 UI, of course. And then we need to clear the caches. So because the plugins expose new routes, we need to know where a, requ a request goes, so we need to clear the caches so that the routes are rebuilt. You can also do that with Rush, and it also works in Drupal 8. Okay. Uh, then we need to configure permissions. Uh, who is able to read that node now that we configure? And you just have to add a... What we do here is add a permission to the anonymous user roles because we want anonymous users to read the nodes now. And there is a permission for that. You can also do that with Rush, but you can do it also in the UI. And for testing, we need to create a, an example node that we want to get. So I played around a bit with the level module, and it has, it has this nice, nice feature of, of generating content with Rush, so that also works pretty awesome. But you, of course, you can also do it in the UI, just creating a basic page there. And yeah, now we can fetch that. So one approach would be um, just fetching that from the command line, because there are tools on Unix-like system, like curl or wget, I'm sending a request. The important thing here is to specify the exact header because you don't want to get HTML, you want to get the help format. So you specify that. Um, and the UI is important. Um, the actual thing that you want to get, in this case, it's just node one. And that's basically it. But you can, of course, also do it for PHP. So you are developing some PHP application. And you can do it with very primitive curl, as you see here. Just set the curl constants to the URI and the exact header. And you get the JSON back, decode that, and that's basically it. And what's even nicer is to use Gussel. It's an HTTP client. It's a library. It's also part of Drupal Core now. Um, so you just create the client there. It's a very nice object-oriented API. Um, put in the URI and the exact header set as well. Um, you do that um, beforehand, and in the end, you call the send method. Then the request is actually made, not before. And then you do decode that from JSON, and you have your uh, node array again. And that looks um, like this. So you have a link section in Hell. I think Lynn is getting back to that later. Um, that refers um, what it is and where it can be found, that thing, node 1 in our case. And then it lists all the properties of that, no of that node, for example, the node ID. And for example, also uh, all fields, the body field here, for example, with, with the body value and also with the format. And that's, that's all you have to do in Drupal 8 to uh, get, node out of Drupal, get nodes out of Drupal. And because you not only want to interact with single resources, you also want to um, retrieve whole collections of nodes. And you can do that in Drupal 8 now with views because it's a logical step to do. We already have a query builder in core. We don't want to do any fancy entity field query stuff ourselves, so we just leverage um, views for that. And you have a special display plugin um, that you can configure uh, that will then expose the, the rows that use retrievers as JSON or HAL or XML, whatever you want. It's very similar or comparable to the views data source module in Drupal 7. So if, if you have used that, you, it might be very uh, similar, familiar for you. And you can either output the whole entity, the whole node. You just want to have a collection of full nodes, which could get a little, a little bit big. So you can also just output individual fields. That's also possible. So much better view support. But of course, you also want to write to Drupal. Um, just reading stuff might be enough for some API that wants to expose something. Now let's look into how you can actually write a new node to Drupal. I'm doing this here with post request, but it's very similar to uh, for patch request if you want to update something. And for that, in order to be able to do that, we have to um, 
go through the same steps as before, copy the um, settings file to the staging directory because we can um, prepare it there and nothing goes, goes wrong in the meantime. So don't edit stuff in your active configuration directory. <laughs> Always copy it to the staging directory and import it from there because it could break the site otherwise. We just add the post operation there and also the format um, in which we want to post stuff. And the next thing we have to do is also um, configure the permissions, who is allowed to post notes. We might not want to give that away to an anonymous user role, so we give it to some trusted role here. And yeah, then repeat the steps from before, input the configuration, clear the cache, and it should be ready to go. Um, yeah, now it's, it gets a bit complicated because we have to do it with cookie authentication, which is not nice, but Gutsful actually makes it, makes it pretty nice. So you just add an array cookie jar here that will um, hold your cookie, and you add that as sub a subscriber to your client, and then you just um, send a post request to the user login form, and the response of that request will carry a cookie, and your client will catch that for you, and the request that you send next will carry that cookie along so you will be authenticated. Pretty straightforward in, in, uh, with Gospel in Google 8. Just specify your name, your password, and the format you want to post to, which is the user login form, and you should be good to go. Yeah, yeah. The next uh, thing you have to do is, because we are posting things and we're doing it with session cookies, uh, we have to do some CSRF protection because otherwise there are, there are flash plugins and other weaknesses in browsers that could be exploited with that, so we have to get an extra uh, session token. Our client is equipped with a session cookie, so it just requests a, a special page to get the token. And then we just build up our node. What, we, what I'm doing here is just um, setting the title field, and I have to configure the type that I want to create. In this case, it's the basic page and content type that we have in the standard installation profile of Drupal 8. JSON encode that whole array, um, and then perform a post request. I also have to specify the content type because Drupal needs to know what format is being used, and I have to specify the um, CSRF token. Yeah, and then I'm good to go. I'm sending them the request. And I will get uh, back a 201 if all went well and Drupal accepted the node, or I will get some other uh, status code from HTTP. For example, 403 would be access denied, or I don't know, for, uh, probably a 400 if I did the format wrong, and a 500 if Drupal did something wrong. Yeah, you get it. It's just uh, the basic HTTP standards. And how does that all play together in REST module itself? So let's take a look inside how that works out. So we have resource plugins. We use the plugin system because we want to make those components that are responsible for loading stuff and storing stuff swappable. Uh, we want to make them configurable. Um, we want to make it easy so that people can add additional resource plugins in Drupal 8 country. And the most important thing that those plugins do, they separate um, serialization on the one side and data handling on the other side. And the plugins only handle the data, um, only handle actual storing and loading data. They are not at all concerned about serialization. So that is completely separate, and that allows you um, to quickly configure new formats or to adapt your formats for your particular resource that you want to expose. And don't be confused by plugins. They are only classes, basically. They're just a class with, with some methods on them, and that's all a plugin is in Drupal 8. And what we do is, on that uh, resource plugin, you have um, methods that are named exactly as the HTTP method. So for example, if you have a get method there, it will handle your get request. If you have a post method there, it will handle your post request, patch method for patch request, and so on. And yeah, what we do in core is we have one entity uh, plugin to rule them all, and it exposes um, derivatives for each entity type. So yeah, that's, that's a feature of the plugin system, which is very nice. And as I said, contributed modules can uh, hook into there and also stuff for provide new stuff. So there's also a short example in Drupal 8 core, which um, just exposes uh, watchdog log entries um, as a resource. And if I perform a GET request to slash dblog slash one, I need to configure that before, same as I did for nodes, and I need to assign the permissions to access that resource, so that's the very same. And that is what's the plugin look like. So, um, as you can see, we use annotations in Drupal 8, and the add plugin um, tells the 
the plugin system, hey, this is an, an actual plugin, and you have to place that file in a special folder in your uh, contrib module, and that plugin has an ID, and it ex extends a resource-based class, which is just the helper to get the routes and um, the permissions and other stuff. You don't have to extend from that. You can also uh, write that on your own and override the, the routes, for example. And the, so the ID gets passed in. What we are doing here, we're just loading the watchdog entry that that ID refers to from the database and then return it. And if you look closer, you can see um, when we perform the get request, it translates to the method name, as I said. Um, the plugin ID translates into the route, so the URI path where this is located. It doesn't have to be like that. It's just a default case where we just take the plugin ID and stick it up. But you can you can change that. And here at the end is the resource that we are referring to, so that gets passed in, so that we know which data to load and which um, entry to return. And that's what the response looks like in HELL, for example. Well, HELL might not be appropriate here because it's just basically JSON, because that example just um, returns an array, and so it just translates to very dumb JSON. If you want to do more fancy things, you might want to use um, actually class object, and then write your um, special serializers for that so that you can um, customize this format and, and make it look more appealing. And out of the box, you also get that, uh, get that as XML. So what you did, you just wrote the resource plugin and you get JSON support and XML support for free, which is really nice. I guess that's it. Yeah, I have another picture here of how that pipeline works uh, for REST module. So we have the incoming request that is dispatched by the routing system to the request handler, which is part of the module. And Serializer is an external component, and what it does is just, if there is um, content on the request, oh, yeah, I know, I have to uh, deserialize that, so I put it in the pipeline, and whatever comes out there, I pass on to the plugin. And whatever the plugin returns, I set it through Serializer, and then that's get, uh, in, that gets back as response to the uh, client. And the resource plugins are only, um, the only responsibility is to talk to the database or do their business logic, whatever they have to do. So, back to Lynn for serialization. Okay, so Klaus was showing you all this JSON and XML, and I want to show you how you actually get your data into JSON and XML. So we um, currently have three formats in core. We have JSON. We have XML, kind of, sort of. It's basically just JSON with angle brackets. Um, we don't actually do namespacing or attributes. So if you actually want real XML, I would suggest not using this one. But um, I will explain a little bit about how you can write your own serialization um, normalizers and encoders really easily. Um, and then there's the hypertext application language, which is our hypermedia format. We went with um, one that supports um, linking, doing hypermedia in JSON, um, but it also has an XML variant. If you want to use that, you can. Um, so we depended on the Symphony serializer component. Um, I actually really like the way that they approached um, this. Basically, what you do, uh, if you want to use Serializer, which you, you don't have to use REST to use Serializer. Serializer is completely independent. If you want to use Serializer, all you have to do is get it from the container and then call Serialize and pass in your object in the format. And you, optionally, you can pass in some stuff in context. But um, what it does is it takes that object, for example, uh, let's say it's a node, and it passes it through a series of what are called normalizers to take that node's object structure and um, translate it into an array structure. Uh, and that array structure can be different for different formats. And then the encode step um, takes it from the array structure into the string. So in JSON, you know, it adds the curly braces and all that kind of stuff. Or in XML, it would add the angle brackets and tags, and, you know. So the way this works, it gives you fine-grained control over how your resource is actually serialized. So let's say that we have a node here, and it has a text field, and a text long field, and an image field, and a taxonomy term reference. Basically, I'm describing an article here. And in your, um, in your JSON, you have field image, and let's say that it's actually giving you the file ID instead of you know, whatever you actually want to have as the data for your field image. Um, 
you know, you might actually want to have the URI of the, of the image file itself. You can write what's called a normalizer just to change that. And the rest of the uh, pipeline is exactly the same, you know, just one or two lines of code inside of a class. Um, and so the way that this works is there's what's called a chain of responsibility for your normalizers. So we have the entity reference item normalizer, the field item normalizer, the field normalizer, and the entity normalizer. These are the normalizers that HAL module provides. Um, and you'll notice that they're getting, they're going from more specific to less specific, from more uh, granular to um, larger range. Uh, and what happens in Serializer is it actually goes through, when it has some data, it goes through and it asks, you know, do you support normalization for this object and in this format? And within your normalizer, you can say, yes, I support entity reference item fields, or no, I do not support, you know, entity reference item fields. And so in this case, because we're working with an image field, um, it would say, no, I don't support that. Then we get to the field item normalizer, and um, image fields, the image item actually extends field item base, so it would actually be supported by the field item normalizer. So let's say that you do want to override how the image field is output. You just add a normalizer at the top of the chain, and then when it calls supports normalization, that normalizer will be chosen as the one to use. So that's the nice thing. It gives you that really fine green control without having to change too much, override too much. Um, all you have to do is add your normalizer. Same thing for encoders. Encoders are a little bit um, simpler, but um, that is the uh, chain of responsibility that gives us such fine green control. So I was thinking about talking more about serialization, but you know, I'm thinking it might actually be better if anyone here wants to write a serialization, just come talk to me. I'll be here for the next three days. Um, I'd be happy to walk you through uh, the rest of, you know, that pretty much, that gets you um, pretty far, but uh, if you actually want to get hands on, I'm happy to walk through. So what's next? As I said, there's this maturity model. And Roy Fielding has made pretty clear that Roy Fielding is the guy who, who came up with the idea of REST. Um, he's made pretty clear that unless you have level three, you are not really a REST API. Uh, most, most people who talk about REST APIs, and I think even within the Drupal community, some of the expectation has just been level one and level two. Um, but if we really want to be RESTful, we also have to have level three. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about what level three gives you. Uh, and this is another example from Martin Fowler's blog. Um, he has the uh, walkthrough of making a doctor's appointment via an API. So let's say a hospital has um, this API and you can actually build iPhone applications to interact with it. Um, and the nice thing about that is then the hospital, it doesn't have to manage all of the uh, iPhone apps by themselves. You know, by opening up that ecosystem, you uh, provide the way uh, a path for innovation. So when somebody were to click this upcoming appointments button on, on their phone, it would get a list of open slots in the schedule. And to do that, it would just send a get request against the URI for slots and tell it what um, content type it wants to receive back. So the server would return a list of open appointments. And if you look here, we have one of these URIs that I was talking about before. This is a link relation. The app would have to know that it's looking for this link relation. It's looking for the link relation that allows you to book an appointment. And then it gives you the href, the actual uh, place that you go to to book this appointment. So that's what we're talking about with link relations. It's basically pointers to where you can go next to do something else. And so, the client would choose the appointment that they want, and they would post a message to that URI. And they add their own link to tie their, um, their content to something. Um, basically, this is another link relation. The client would have to know about this link relation that, there's, uh, that they need to provide a patient, and um, then they could provide the URI of the patient. 
and then the server re returns confirmation. It also returns links that tell the client what it can do next after this. So for example, we have a cancel here. And then you would have a cancel appointment button. And this tells you what URI to go to to actually do that. Um, so it is the case that you actually do need to know what these link relations are in order to do something meaningful in your application. But there are two benefits of hypermedia. Um, one, and this is Martin Fowler actually is the one who uh, I'm quoting here. One, it allows the server to change its URI scheme without breaking clients, also known as decoupling. And it helps client developers explore the protocol, also known as discoverability. So let's say, let's look at what decoupling does for you. So an example of a hard-coded way to, do, to construct that cancel URI is just, you know, you, you look at the URI structure, you, as a human, process what that URI structure is, and then you write in a rule for how it's constructed. The problem with this is if they ever change their URI structure, which is, you know, reasonably likely, your, your uh, application breaks. So if you use the link relation to access it, then you don't have to worry about whether or not they change the URI structure. You're not depending on their URI structure. You're just accessing the URI itself. Um, there's also something called templating that you can do in, um, in REST. I'm not going to get into that, but um, you can also basically have the rules for creating the URI as part of your message. And then discoverability. So, you know, we have this view patient info button and this cancel appointment button, and those came from the uh, link relations that I know about in my application. When I was coding it, I knew what these were. Now, let's say you're six months down the line, you're looking at a response that's coming in, and you see a new link relation, um, like add symptom. The thing, what's recommended to do is uh, to document your link relations at the actual URI. This is one good thing about using URIs for link relations. Um, you could, as a developer, when you see that new URI, just go to it, find the documentation, and figure out what it's supposed to do. And then you can add a new button to your user interface. So that's what discoverability is. It gives developers a way to discover the new features of an API. So Hypermedia and Drupal, this is, as I said, kind of an open question still. We do have link relations for entity reference, et cetera. But what else could we um, expose with Hypermedia controls? What else do we want to expose with um, Hypermedia controls? Do we want to do entity management links? Do we want to do pagination with the views? Um, so that is what we are going to be looking at next. And if folks have ideas for that, we'll be around all weekend um, and would be happy to talk about all this stuff. Thank you very much. Okay, so there were a few questions on Twitter, and uh, we will try to answer those either as direct tweets back to the people, or if we can here, we'll, we'll answer them here. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, you talked about the chain of responsibility for deserializing data. Could you talk about how that gets handled for serializing potentially a, a post or a put? So that in that example of posting patient slash Lynn Clark wants this appointment, I imagine the server would then need to take patient Lynn Clark and get the entity ID of that entity and save the actual entity. So does that does the reverse process look like the chain of responsibility for the serialization process? Funny you should ask. It actually does. Um, we uh, introduced this thing called an entity resolver that also uses a chain of responsibility and interface uh, stuff. It gets a little complex, so I will, um, unless anybody is dying to hear, I might catch up with you afterwards <laughs> to explain the details of that. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, are, are there major items that look like they won't make it into Drupal by code freeze? And we've been hearing this week more and more about the idea of either incremental releases to Drupal 8 that add features or an 
a 9x that Chris mentioned in his Q&A that could add features but not break any backwards compatibility with what we'd have in 8.0? Are there things in the REST world that could be added to core either in an 8.5 or a 9x that would add on top of what is already done? Well, one thing is actually documenting the link relations. We don't actually provide documentation at those URLs right now. Um, we haven't focused on that because that is not an API change kind of a thing. Um, so that's something that could come in at 8.1 or 8.2. Um, Klaus, do you have any? Yeah, so the, the biggest pain point is currently authentication in Drupal 8 for the REST model because we only have session authentication, which is pretty bad. But yeah, we hope to make it so that you can easily add that in Contrib. And also page caching is really painful in Drupal 8. It's still not fixed. It's still very broken, the same as in Drupal 7. If you have um, different representations of a resource on one path and page caching is enabled, you, you run into problems. It's, it's really depressing. If you want to help with that, just talk to me. <laughs> OK, thanks. Hi, uh, so mentioned we can use the accept headers to ask for a specific format of a resource. So how far uh, has content negotiation been developed in Drupal 8 so far? So do I have to ask for a very specific um, uh, media type, or can I do things like, okay, give me XML if you have it, if not, give me JSON? Is that already there, or is it still in development? Um, that, as far as I am aware, is still in development. We uh, basically, if you send a request that's for application JSON and you have other preferences, I think it sends you um, a, a four, or it should send you a 406 um, if it doesn't have the one that you specified first. I think that's. If yeah, we, we have no fancy content negoci negotiation in place, so if you send multiple stuff, I have no idea what happens. In the okay. case, I probably the first one gets chosen, I don't know. So, just please send one. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys are, if you guys are my, one follow-up question uh, with respect to page caching. I mean, is it only broken if I use the built-in cache, or can I use Varnish and say something like very uh, exact? Yes, you can do that, but a core needs to be aware of that as well. And currently, core isn't aware of it, so it's a problem. Hey, um, short question for the link relations. Uh, the examples we showed, they actually had math.org in there. Mm -hmm. Does this really depend on the base URL in Drupal, or is it something I can define because I'm worried about staging development stuff? Right. Um, so it is currently automatically created um, based on what where the site is. Okay. Um, we could look into figuring out how to change that if you want. Okay. Well, I'm just thinking because then I would have to change my client, not only the URL, actually the whole code, to search for the link URLs if I'm working with the dev server. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would. Um, but let's fix it. I mean, we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you uh, kind of answered this uh, right in the first question, but I just wanted to hear more, one of the things I really like about the services module is the authentication plugin ability, because we have clients that have to authenticate with basic auth, SAML, and cookie auth, and we have to accept all of those, and it's really nice to be able to just define your own authentication plugins, and so maybe you can talk more about how you're going to handle that with the Drupal 8, because cookie auth only is going to be a major blocker in adopting this. Yes, it is. Um, so we are trying to keep it out of REST module because it, it itself might not be concerned about that and other system might use the same mechanism as well. So what we will try to do is to make it really a core feature that can be used by possibly other modules. And yeah, there, there will be some mechanism to look into the system and check the request for other authentication credentials. But yeah, we also need to make the page cache aware um, what the authentication plugins are looking for because the page cache needs to vary based on whether this is an authenticated request or not. So yeah, that, that, that's the biggest problem. It's currently it's it's a, a little bit broken, but we're going to work on it. If you want to help, just step up. All right, thanks. I am um, just wondering if uh, we can make a put request to IGU ID for content deployment. Um, so that actually ties in with a, another question that was on Twitter, which is why we are not supporting put. Um, 
And there's actually a couple of good discussions as to why we're not supporting put. Um, one is something that Larry posted called putting off put. I'm going to tweak the URIs for URLs for these. Um, so he posted an explanation of why we are not supporting put. And there's also um, Roy Fielding in 2009 posted something called It's Okay to Use Patch, where he basically said, you know, you often don't actually want to use put. So I just wanted to mention those. Using put for content deployment um, so that you can actually have the same identifier or, okay, so you can have the same local identifier. Because like UUID, you can actually deploy that without using put. But if you're looking for the same local identifier, then um, you might need to use put for that. I mean, if, if it's to be restful, would the UUID need to be in the URL instead of just using the, the endpoints? Yeah. Um, okay. I, I think, I think we, we haven't decided to use UUID in the URIs because it's so long and not really human readable and a bit uh, of a pain. And also the follow with UEID is that you might, they might not be unique over all uh, entity types. So they, they try to be, but there could be collisions. I mean, yeah, the, the probab probability is pretty low still, but um, it makes the system also more complex to detect which entity type is actually um, going to be posted, for example, or going to be updated. So you would have to iterate over all entity tables to find out what, what is the thing. Okay, and uh, I just had one other question. Um, uh, are we hoping to one day serve web pages through the West, the, 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 the RESTful module? So you're talking about like having blocks in addition to the actual node? Um, I mean the, the HTML that's served directly to the web browser, should that be served via the RESTful module? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the... the the comment was there should be no distinction between the API and the usual HTML page. Um, and I agree to a certain extent, but the problem is we serve HTML mostly as pages, and that's more than just a node. There are blocks around it, there are menus and whatnot. So that is actually something okay. different, I guess. And yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Hey, thanks. Um, I just wanted to, uh, one of the complaints that people have around services or Drupal's core Ajax and stuff like that is that Drupal has to like fully, fully bootstrap just to like spit this stuff out the game system and all that kind of stuff. Um, is there any uh, developments on, on your end or whiskey in general that, that's, that's helping with that problem? Yeah, of course, the, the whole whiskey project that tries to split up Drupal core, especially Drupal bootstrap in a way that it is more lightweight. But yeah, we are operating on the fully bootstrap Drupal and the current, um, the current implementation in Drupal 8, in Drupal 8 core. Okay. So, yeah, we have to load stuff that we need, so we can't avoid that. Well, right, yeah. The, the NCD API has a lot of dependencies mm -hmm. okay. because it needs to know about stuff, so, yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, the whole point of API and RESTful uh, is for your services is to make it easier for machines to read your data, consume your data. Uh, don't you think that by basically providing this inconsistent URIs, like for nodes, com comments, blocks, users, and so on and so forth, then we get hard for other developers to write code that will actually consume that data? So you're saying that we should use the same URI structure for both, for both nodes and users? For all of these guys. Um, so, and you wouldn't have like node in the URI? No, you wouldn't. You would have entity and then, the, for example, UUID of an entity. And um, it will be very simplified, unified, and basically any, anyone who's writing an app would be able to consume that data reusing the same code instead of writing this, you know. So, yeah, what I've seen as best practice is to actually specify what kinds of um, entities you're working upon. That I think that's actually considered developer, ex you know, a developer experience win when you actually specify that you're talking to a certain kind of um, entity. Um, and also, you wouldn't be able to reuse the code totally because different um, entities might have different link relations. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of stuff that actually is specific to the domain model um, of that particular entity. So you wouldn't necessarily want to have something that's generically working across users and nodes and you know everything else. And it would be very slow. 
because you have to search all entity tables for that UUID. Well, performance aside, I think uh, what we're doing here now is we're actually making it harder to develop apps and to actually read data that's supposed to be easier to read. Because like, if I'm writing, a, for example, a piece of code that's supposed to consume five entity types, accelerometer with nodes, blocks, users, I have to basically modify my code five times instead of having one piece of code that will retrieve that data very easily. Um, I'm going to table that discussion. If you want to continue that discussion, we can continue it. But I think that there are a lot of people that would disagree with the idea that that improves developer experience. There's a lot of blog posts that actually recommend the opposite. So um, that, I think that's a discussion we can have um, maybe afterwards. Uh, second question is regarding uh, staging content. Uh, is it like in the works or what is uh, or what would be the status of it? But because you do need uh, UUIDs in order to stage content. You can't really uh, stage it with local IDs. So we have uh, UUIDs and they actually do, you know, basically um, the UUID is actually uh, ingested and used when you're posting. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? There were a few people that actually asked questions on Twitter. I'd be happy to go over those questions now if people want. Okay. So yeah, there were people asking about the put and patch, and um, I will post those two blog posts. Um, but basically, when you're doing a put, the, there's kind of a strict semantics to put. You're supposed to replace everything. And so that's why Roy Fielding actually said a lot of times you want to use post and not put. Um, and so we figured that we don't know what people are going to be doing, um, what fields people are going to attach, and whether or not they're writable, and whether or not, uh, you know, all of the, all of these other things. So uh, it's safer to go with patch, we think. Um, we can actually abide by the semantics of it. Uh, more, more faithfully. Um, somebody asked if there was a uh, CRUD for views, like basically if you're going to be able to edit your views using REST, and um, that's a config entity, and we're not really supporting config entities. Um, go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, now that um, configuration is, is entities like views are configuration entities, it might be possible. I haven't tried it actually, but it could be feasible. Yeah. But why, why would you? <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the arguments we actually had while we were discussing that was, um, you know, configuration, you can already do it in YAML and then, you know, use Git or something to get it up to your site. So it's kind of more, it makes more sense for config to actually manage it in code um, rather than over HTTP. Uh, yes, go ahead. I just have a quick question. The uh, DB log example you showed, is that how easy it is to create like a custom resource that's maybe not an entity that you know, just exposes it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> At least I hope. I guess, <laughs> I guess people will run into problems, but yeah, we try to make it as easy as we can get. So um, there's another question. If I use views in D8 to limit fields, can I still load it from the cache? And I actually have not looked deeply enough into the views integration to say. I don't think so, but... I think uh, you can just use the standard views caching. So views, if views retrieves all that rows and caches them somewhere. That should uh, work the same for the REST display plugin. So just the standard views caching. Yeah, because it, it's using get items in both cases, um, the, the function get items um, in views. So whatever that does, if that allows you to have access to the cache, then yes. Um, somebody asked you to talk more about our use of CSRF tokens and uh, specifically the fact that it seems to be a carryover from Form API. Yeah, it does something similar like Form API because you have to verify that the post request that is performed is actually made by that client and not on behalf of someone. So that they usually exploit that you have to go to some um, external site and it executes some JavaScript or some Flash. And you're, you're just visiting the site and the JavaScript is already executing and then sending a post request on your behalf to your actual Drupal site. And what happens if you are logged in as an administrator at that site? that request will be performed with your administrator permissions. So it could do a lot of harm. For example, delete request, delete stuff, or update stuff in a very not nice way. I'm 
your behalf. That's why we have to talk back to the server to retrieve the token and then add that to the request so that it's, it is actually, uh, that it is actually, actually uh, an original request that is intended to be sent. I hope, yeah. A couple of other frameworks do it the same way. I guess Ruby and Django use a similar header, if not the same, for uh, post requests that are performed with uh, cookie session authentication. So basically, we, we just took it from there. You have a question. Hi. Um, I'm fairly new to REST, but uh, I was wondering, is it possible if you want to uh, get node data from the REST API, uh, but you don't want the full node object, if you only want to pull in say something really simple like the node ID, the title, and the body, um, are you able to, and is it advisable to strip out the other fields? Um, there are uh, different APIs that do that. There are people who talk about how to do that basically using get um, parameters. We are not currently supporting that. That's something that could be supported in Contrib. I don't think that we're, um, you know, core, we, we're trying to limit what we put into core just because we have to maintain that through the years. Uh, and so for some of this exper experimentation, we're really looking to contrib to, to do some of that experimentation. But yes, it's definitely something that people do and that you could do. Cool. So the comment was that, the comment was that in REST it's supposed to be a granular API. Um, yeah, we, I think we tried to be ge as generic as possible in Drupal Core and just output everything that the user has access to by default. But if you want to output something different, just uh, rip out some fields, for example, I guess you just write your, uh, your own um, normalizer, denormalizer for, for the serialization system, and then you can easily get rid of that. I guess a lot of people will do it because, yeah, there's a lot of crap on notes that you might not want to show to your public API consumers. consumers. Cool, thank you. Another thing that you could do is actually write something generic that um, is a resource plugin and then prepares the entity before it gets to serialize. So that would be another option. So. Okay. Um, any other questions? Let's see. There was one person asking about Google authentication. So I don't know what the question was. Then. You were this um, I think the question was just uh, if I could elaborate more on Gazla authentication. Uh, I'm not sure if there is a special handler in Gazla that deals with authentication, so I just played around for that demonstration with uh, session authentication, so I'm not really familiar with that. I think I have to, maybe someone else can answer it. Yeah, well, the, the internet will do, just Google it. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? We're also happy to answer your questions afterwards if you want, um, but, but we're here as long as you guys want to keep asking questions. Okay. <laughs>